questions because my focus or my research focus is a little bit different. And as you might uh, have guessed from the introduction, I deal a lot in medical education and think about it across the continuum of learners from UME to GME to CME. Um, and then my my clinical interest or my scholarly interest is actually in uh, metacognition, so clinical reasoning and deliberate practice. And so um, I will share my screen, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And what I hope to do is to give you a background in some of these topics. Um, clinical reasoning has been a big focus of study for the last couple of decades um, and has gone from sort of a, a research program into something that informs our teaching at the UME and GME level um, and deliberate practice is just a little bit behind that. But what I hope to do is then give you some tools for bringing that into um, the work that you do clinically, especially when you work with trainees. Um, just as a disclosure, I serve as a consultant for MBME. And so we'll start out by talking about clinical reasoning get a bit more into deliberate practice. Um, and then finally, I'll bring the two together. So to start clinical reasoning. So for the purposes of this talk, um, I use the following definition and there are many out there, but I think this one's the most straightforward, um, especially for people who work clinically. So the processing and assimilating of pre-existing knowledge and current patient specific information to support medical practice. And that can be further subdivided into diagnostic reasoning, which is what many people think of when they think of clinical reasoning, um, as well as management reasoning, which is a newer area of focus and one of my particular areas of interest. So I wanna make sure to give it um, proper time if you aren't familiar with it. Diagnostic reasoning, I think of as a classification task that assigns meaningful labels to constellations of data, signs, symptoms, results from diagnostic tests to make a diagnosis. Management reasoning, on the other hand, is a prioritization task, so really different from a cognitive perspective about testing, treatment, and allocation of resources. And then management reasoning, um, to get a little bit pedantic, and this is where we can uh, cause some arguments in the liter literature, uh, can be further divided into testing reasoning. So the decision to obtain additional diagnostic tests is technically considered um, a, a management reasoning decision. Um, and then therapeutic reasoning, or choice between different drug options. So when I think about diagnostic reasoning, um, I think about the following sort of characterization. So at any given point in time, there is a diagnosis and that diagnosis um, is either objectively correct or incorrect. It can be more, specific, more specified. So you can start out with something like back pain um, that's very general and that's all you know at that point and move into something more specific such as acute uh, osteomyelitis from hematogenous spread, even getting down to organism. But at any given point in time, there is a diagnosis, di diagnosis that you should have, and it's either objectively correct or incorrect. As a result, diagnosis is independent of patient preferences or context, um, and it does not require interaction with the patient. And um, an example I give of, of how this could be true is think about morbidity and mortality report, morning report for residency, about the different clinical cases that are often shared in journals or through interactive media. You can reason through that case, engaging in diagnostic reasoning separated in both time and space from the patient. Um, and there are a finite range of solutions and interacting factors. Management reasoning is a lot different. Um, so instead of that one correct diagnosis, there are often multiple reasonable solutions, um, never a single correct option. And I love giving this talk to um, a group of ID providers because I can say the only time that isn't true is in a person who's pregnant who has syphilis, but I think even then some of the uh, considerations are changing. Management must prioritize the patient, the provider, um, and system preferences, constraints, and values. And because of that, it requires communication and shared decision-making. So you can't do it in your head in a vacuum. And 
through longitudinal relationships, whether that be a week over the course of a week of a hospitalization or long-term in clinic when we were living with HIV, it requires ongoing monitoring and adjustment, and it's a moving target and never really completely specified. And in some, it's a dynamic interplay among people, system settings, and competing priorities. And because of that, they're unavoidable and management is thought to be inherently complex and situated, meaning with the context in which it occurs, which is why it's hard to discuss management or harder in these sort of case conferences um, and, and why it's harder to test around management as well. So a schematic I like to use to show the dynamic interplay between diagnosis and management, acknowledging that it's not a linear process and that it's very iterative, um, I put on this screen. So a patient presents with a concern uh, and the clinician takes a history, performs a physical exam, um, and then obtains uh, the results of diagnostic tests. And that's a, te or that's a step in diagnostic reasoning called data acquisition. The clinician then summarizes all that information into a, um, a concise distillation of the clinical case at hand, and that is the problem representation. That problem representation, in turn, triggers a list of potential diagnoses, uh, the differential diagnosis, if you will, um, through a process called hypothesis generation. And we think of these illness scripts. So it's everything that you know about a given diagnosis that you keep in, in a folder in your head. And then through a process called illness, Collection. Again, that occurs mostly in the mind of the clinician. Um, they compare the different illness scripts with the specific clinical uh, situation at hand, and that leads to a working diagnosis. Now, this is when we get over into management. So that man or that working diagnosis triggers an array of options for management: diagnostic tests, consultation, therapies, ongoing monitoring. And um, these are known as management scripts. And we'll talk a little bit more about the management script later in this talk. And the management script um, in the clinician's mind is then compared to the clinical situation at hand. But there's a globe there because the clinician also has to take into account the system in which they're practicing, the preferences of the patients, the thoughts of the multidisciplinary team. And from there, the clinician develops a management plan of the particular management options that they're choosing in this case. That management plan, in turn, may trigger the a person to obtain more history. I think about that all the time in ID when we go in and we ask additional questions of a patient that the primary team hasn't asked. We may perform additional physical exam maneuvers because of our um, because of the. Um, uh, the differential diagnosis we have at the time and trying to further specify it. We may order more diagnostic tests and we may monitor the response to treatment. So that management plan can then lead to more information feeding into the diagnostic side of the reasoning process and further refinement of the working diagnosis. And so this slide um, shows one of the one of the early research projects that I did was trying to further delineate what exactly does, therapeutic reasoning or the choice of antimicrobials look like um, within ID practitioners as well as hospitalists. And what we found is that from that working diagnosis, which we called naming the syndrome, the uh, clinicians worked to delineate the pathogens either because they had culture results or because um, they, had, they were hypothesizing about what kind of pathogen the patient had which led to them considering various antimicrobial options um, and then finally determining the antibiotic of choice. And we found that this was complex, just as I mentioned, with many different things feeding into the process. So case features, um, how, were there differentiating features such as purulent or non-purulent cellulitis? What was the severity of illness? What was the patient's clinical trajectory? Things like pre-existing patient characteristics, both of these types of um, things fed into both delineation of pathogens as well as the antibiotic that the um, clinician ultimately chose. In addition, there were treatment principles that guided the clinician's um, uh, weighing of the different antimicrobial options as well as provider and healthcare system factors that fed into that process as well. So many, many different factors contributed to the ultimate choice of antibiotics in this 
qualitative study that we per performed, which reinforced this idea that management reasoning is very complex, many factors, and very situated, dependent on the context. And when I talk about situativity, I think it's also useful to show a diagram. So here at the center, we have the patient, and of course, their preferences and values and goals are central to the management plan that we choose. Around that, we have the healthcare team. So we have the clinicians on the team, often many clinicians collaborating together, um, either because you have the consultant and the primary team or because your team itself, whether primary or consultant, is in, includes many different providers at different levels of training. You have your pharmacists, and you have your physical therapist, occupational therapist, nursing, other members of the healthcare team who can all help inform what management plan is appropriate. Beyond that, you have to consider the greater system context. So where is the patient? Are they at home? Are they in the clinic? Are they in the hospital? Or even more pertinent, are they transitioning between these places, which can raise all sorts of interesting management plans, as does the system itself, their insurance, what's on formulary, what's available and easily accessible. Are there constraints on resources in terms of diagnostic tests, those sorts of things. So it's not just in the provider's mind, it very much is centered around the patient, but involves the entire complex system. And so diagnostic reasoning is fairly well-defined in the literature over the last 30 to 35 years. We think of knowledge as organized in those illness scripts I mentioned earlier, and the skills are fairly well accepted to be data acquisition, problem representation, hypothesis generation, and illness script selection, just like in the diagram. For management reasoning, we're still sorting it out. We think that knowledge is in the form of scripts, either management or therapy scripts, and the skills are just being delineated, but we think um, the skills include things like high value care, um, shared decision-making, uh, managing uncertainty, applying thresholds, prioritization, and monitoring and adjusting, but probably there's a lot more skills than just those. And there are foundational concepts we think are involved in management reasoning specifically that I'll just bring up here. So uncertainty, um, which is a state of limited knowledge, often related to probability, complexity, and ambiguity. Thresholds, the probability of the disease when a test or treatment's benefits and harms are equal. High value care, so choosing interventions with an emphasis on quality, service, and cost, and not just financial costs, um, but also the cost in terms of risks and harms or downstream effects. And then shared decision making, engaging with the patient and other stakeholders in the decision making process. So that was all a very, very quick summary of clinical reasoning, um, focusing a lot on the management side of things since it's a newer area of practice. Now I'm going to switch gears a bit and talk more about deliberate practice and what it is um, in terms of the development of expertise and its role in medical training. So it would be nice if um, with additional experience, the quality of our performance increased in a linear and very related fashion. But um, Dr. Erickson, who was actually uh, a psychologist and who was very involved in this, not, in, not at first in medical training, but in training of um, uh, elite musicians at a school in Europe, he did a lot of work in the area of expertise development, and what he found is that um, it's not linear, that there can be a degradation depending on how deliberately you were involved in trying to improve. So when you think about improve, so when you think about everyday skills, for instance, like driving, you probably, if you do drive, spend a lot of time learning to drive um, when you were trying to get your license. And so you were in that cognitive or associative phase where your performance was increasing at a rapid rate. At some point you got your license. Um, and then I think we can all agree from uh, being drivers on the road that skills tend to decline because people don't pay attention to their driving or try to become um, better drivers. And so we go from that really deliberate part of trying to improve to just doing things autonomously. So uh, the example being you may get in your car today to drive home 
And you may not remember the drive home by the time you're in your driveway because you know the route and you're not paying attention to the skill of driving. And so you just arrive where you are. And when you do that with a task, um, you don't necessarily become better at it. In fact, you be can become worse over time. You can spend a little bit more time in that uh, area of trying to become better, um, but then stop. Again, stop paying attention to what you're doing, to trying to become better, and over time you see some of the skills erode. And we see this in medical training. We get through medical school and residency and then fellowship, um, and we're working really hard to develop our skills, but at some point, if we're not paying attention as we enter into being attendings um, and an independent practice, our skills can start to degrade. And so the goal is to always remain cognizant and very focused on improving. Um, and that's the point at which you can become an expert and keep pushing your performance forward. So Erickson created a framework for how one stays engaged in this kind of process, how one becomes an expert. And he termed that deliberate practice and he had five very strict requirements. So one, um, that there has to be a well-defined goal or a micro skill. It can't just be that you're going to become a better violinist, but that you're going to work on particular skills within that to become better. That the person receives specific feedback on that micro skill that they're given multiple continuous opportunity for repetition and refinement, that they're able to give the development of that skill their full attention, and that it's guided um, by a teacher and a coach. And all of this leads to what he called increasingly complex mental representations. And essentially what that means is a person is better able to see the gap between their current performance and the desired performance. And I love this quote from him. And this is, again, when he was first working with uh, elite prodigy musicians. Um, I think it was in Geneva. And he said, initially, however, the majority of young musicians lack the ability to hear the sounds of their own music. Without an instructor to help them identify and correct problems, beginners end up just playing the same mistakes over and over and over and when I read this quote, uh, it makes so much sense to me um, that early on in training, you, you don't know what you don't know and how easily we can make an analogy to, to medical training from this quote, that people don't know the mistakes they're making unless they're pointed out and they can um, be guided to improvement. So I should say that this is all great, but this is really time intensive and onerous and resource intensive. Um, and so we'll start to think about how we can apply that in complex patient care situations. But the first people to think about um, applying deliberate pra practice to medical training were the proceduralists. And in fact, there's been a lot of this work in procedures. So central line insertion, paracentesis, thoracentesis, mostly in residents. They've also done this with ACLS and even breaking bad news with fourth, fourth year medical students. And basically what they do is they give learners a pretest, then they have the learners engage in deliberate practice, all five steps. They're very hyper-focused on these very specific micro skills, they're given practice opportunities, they're giving, given feedback, they're guided by a coach, then they're giving, given a post-test and either they meet a minimum passing standard or they don't. And if that happens, they don't fail, they go back into deliberate practice until they can meet the minimum passing standard. And most of this work is out of Northwestern and it's pretty clear that deliberate practice works really well for procedural skills. But what about non-procedural skills um, and ID? That's really the realm in which we're operating. So how can we think about this very strict definition for how we develop expertise in the context of what we do? And can we apply it specifically to clinical reasoning, which it takes up a large portion of the cognitive work that we do when we think about diagnosing and then treating patients? So that's where we get into the last portion um, of my talk. And we'll talk about some barriers to applying deliberate practice to clinical reasoning. We'll explore some formal programs, but mostly we'll discuss some strategies that I think you can apply in your work as ID clinicians when you're working with learners um, to help them develop expertise.
So here are those five requirements that Erickson laid out for deliberate practice to develop expertise. And so what's the problem here in the work that we do? Well, I'll just put all of these out. Oops, you can probably guess. So for micro skills, um, the problem is variability. And I don't think of variability as a problem, right? That's why many of us chose to go into ID because the questions are often different, even when it's the same more common thing like a UTI or pneumonia, it always seems that there's nuance to the question. And so the variability makes it hard to say, okay, if all of those things are different in every case, like how can there be a single micro skill that a trainee can focus on to improve upon? Um, provision of feedback, that's not unique to ID. It's I think across medical training in general. Um, to give feedback can be vulnerable for faculty who feel fear retribution in their evaluations. If they're honest with trainees and trainees can find um, that kind of feedback about how they can improve specifically um, also puts them in a vulnerable spot. Opportunities for repetition and refinement. Again, there's the problem with variability. We see different things every day, but there's also the patient safety concern. So we're trying to provide the best possible care for patients. And so how do we balance training autonomy and the ability to sort of trial things out with the need to give patients the standard of care? Providing our full attention for this is really hard, especially in the modern training environment. There's a lot of burnout and fatigue coming out of the pandemic on the part of both trainees and attending clinicians. There are service requirements. You need to just get through the day and provide the care and other competing priorities like research. And then guidance by a teacher and a coach. That takes time, time that often comes into conflict with our service requirements and efficiency concerns. And then it can be hard to form longitudinal relationships where this feels feasible and effective. So how do we think about overcoming these things when we're attending on ID? Well, I think it starts with our role as a teacher and a coach. And I come back to this quote from Erickson. And so the first thing that we can do is think about the micro skill. And that involves diagnosing the learner. And this is where we really get metacognitive because I'm talking about figuring out what is the learner's specific deficit around clinical reasoning? What is the skill I can ask them to learn on? So that's where your role as a teacher and a coach really comes in um, to focus. Then you can give them digestible specific feedback and that's really communicating one thing. So what's the first and most important thing they can do differently to become better at this particular skill? Then you offer them opportunities for repetition and refinement and you can choose specific educational strategies and I'm going to give you at least, um, I'm gonna give you several of those today that you can put into practice pretty efficiently during rounds um, to help them work on this micro skill. Full atti attention, of course, means that you don't take too long and that you take a bite-sized chunk of this. Um, and then as a teacher and coach, you can help the learner understand where they need to go next. And again, it's just a micro skill and it's a micro step up, small movements towards expertise. So I'm going to talk a bit about this micro skill teaching and give you some examples um, from ID, but this framework comes from uh, former mentors of mine at UCSF. And I think it's so helpful when we're sometimes confronted with very busy clinical teaching services where we can be overwhelmed by the number of different things we can help a learner with. And so what I recommend and what they recommended is that you start with the learner's presentation because that's where you see their work and you can ask them up front to show their work when they give their presentations. You can then choose the one specific micro skill on which to focus. After rounds or precepting, you can illuminate the gap between desired performance and their actual performance through the provision of feedback. You can brainstorm together to bridge the gap and allow the learner to try again in real time. Assign a goal for subsequent cases that you'll see together either the next day on rounds or the next time they're in clinic with you and then repeat it each time you work with the learner. Or if you're not going to work with them again, you can tell them to work on this the next day with the next attending. 
So I put these different clinical reasoning um, knowledge and skills up here because I told you we were focused on micro skills. That's how we make this feasible within the clinical learning environment. And we're going to pick one skill on which to focus. So let's say you feel like your learner needs to focus on the problem representation. And I'll show you a little bit of what the micro skill teaching looks like. So they provide you with an incomplete problem representation. And we all know how essential that problem representation, the assessment, um, is for helping the team reason through the clinical situation. So you can then coach them on what elements, such as the demographics of the patient, the relevant past medical history, the description of the syndrome, the semantic qualifiers like acute, subacute, chronic are missing from their problem representation. And then ask them what aspects of the patient's history should be included, what associated symptoms. So imagine a learner in this situation, an early learner who's on your ID consult team, and they come in and tell you the story of a patient who is presenting with a fever and a cough. Uh, and it ends up that the patient is coming in, has is living with HIV, is not on ART, has a CD4 of 10, and the cough is chronic, chronic and associated with dyspnea on exertion. Those are all important qualifiers that help with the problem representation from the get-go, and they have, may have been missing that when they presented. So then you give them this feedback, and then you provide an expanded problem representation for them and ask them to try again in this case and in each subsequent case for the week. Some people, I think the pitfall here is they may sort of say, well, you know, they presented the patient who had cough and fever and they didn't include all that relevant information. And then they didn't really have a differential beyond just community acquired pneumonia. And then they only had one treatment option for community acquired pneumonia. And so you see all these problems with their clinical reasoning in the case. But if you start with something simple like problem representation, a lot of those other things will be corrected along the way. So with early learners, sometimes the best thing to start with is the first thing from which reasoning improves um, as kind of a, a, a trickle down effect. But let's say you wanna focus on management reasoning um, and you wanna focus on knowledge instead of skills. So you're thinking about the management script or the therapy script. So an example here might be that the learner proposes one medication over another, considering only one aspect of the drug. Um, so maybe the patient is being discharged after being admitted for cellulitis and the trainee promote, proposes um, uh, linazolid because it's the same spectrum or similar spectrum to the IV vancomycin the patient was receiving while admission. So you might, while well admitted. So you may say something like, there are many characteristics to consider when choosing an antibiotic. What else should we consider about these drugs? And then share your therapy script template to help the learner scaffold knowledge. And so this is important because you're saying, what are other factors that are important to consider when we choose an antibiotic besides you know, having a similar spectrum to the one the patient was just on? And then you can ask them to apply the template that you provide them in every case this week using drug factors, many of them to inform choice. So what does this look like? Well, this is from some of the research I did on therapeutic reasoning. And this is what the, these are the different drug characteristics that attending clinicians had in their minds when they were thinking about any, any given antibiotic. So they would understand adverse effects are, cost or formulary considerations, the dosing, such as how frequently the patient needs to take the medication or how many tablets they might need to take with each dose, the duration of therapy required when using that type of um, antimicrobial choice, drug-drug interactions, to, um, evidence of efficacy, guidelines, uh, monitoring requirements, pharmacokinetic considerations, route, and safety in pregnancy. So for trainees who are really focused on maybe a, not enough drug characteristics when making a choice, you can provide them with this therapy script and then give them something like this table, which I actually, this is a table I provide um, our first year medical students uh, to organize their knowledge around with different 
antibiotic choices. So you can provide them with this template. So they're keeping this information and they're really filling out the knowledge they have about any given antimicrobial for any given day while on your team. A management script I mentioned earlier, these are all the potential therapeutic options or management options a person may have um, for a given diagnosis. And you see two, the comparison of a junior to senior clinician side by side. So a junior clinician for something like fever and shortness of breath may have a list of potential things like ID consult, chest x-ray, supplemental O2, sputum culture, CBC with differential. So that may be all they can kind of think about with any given diagnosis. Whereas a senior clinician is going to have a much more robust management script. Um, and again, these are not options that you take them all in any given case, but it's sort of the menu of options you have for a particular diagnosis. And what I hope you'll notice is not only the list longer, but it's also organized. So it's, it's the categorized, the different types of management options from which to choose. So you can provide your learners with um, scripts like this to have. And so you say to them, for each case this week, I want you to come up with a full range of options um, for this particular diagnosis and then select which one in each category we're going to use. And it may not be that you fill in every category for every case, but it helps learners understand that there's always multiple options um, and that they have to think about the reasons for selecting a particular option in a particular case. So these tools, the therapy script and the management script are really helpful for allowing your learners to round out their medical knowledge around management reasoning. So here might be a whole list of potential options and then the learner puts their nickel down for what you're going to choose to do in this one particular case. Okay, so we'll stay with management reasoning and give one more example. And that may be that you decide you wanna focus with on shared decision-making or choosing high value care with your learners. You sort of say like, well, their, their diagnostic reasoning seems solid. Um, they're able to have a pretty good idea of what the different management options are, but they're not engaging with the patients around their preferences and values when making decisions, or they're not necessarily thinking about high value care when they make their decisions. So what types of tools do you have for working on those micro skills? Um, so imagine that a learner chooses a management option without consideration of the contextual factors. You may choose to deploy a pause procedure, and I'll give you two here, um, to help them engage in that kind of conversation. So the two that I'll tell you about today are the management pause and the equity reflection. And then ask them, um, to ask themselves these questions for every plan this week. And this is something you can ask them to do. And this is also something you can tell the team. I'm going to be deploying these pauses um, regularly as we go through and talk about patients this week on, on rounds. So the management pause um, is really nice uh, because it hits at several different skills, not just high value care. So you can ask the trainees, why are we choosing this intervention for this patient? What are the potential downsides that gets them to help engage in, in uh, weighing risks and benefits? What are potential alternatives? So how broad is their management script around therapy? And why aren't we choosing them? So again, getting them to engage in weighing risks and benefits and different considerations. And then have we asked the patient for their perspective? So have they done shared decision-making? So with this brief, pretty efficient teaching tool, you can pause the team, you can probe the learner's understanding of why they um, proposed a particular management plan. You can get them to fill out their management script. You can get them to discuss risks and benefits, and then you can get them to um, ensure that they're engaging in shared decision-making. So this one does a lot. And by just pausing for these four questions intermittently uh, around decision-making with your teams on rounds, you make the learner cognizant of these different factors. You can similarly engage in an equity reflection. Um, and what I love about the equity reflection is it really gets us to think about 
bringing health equity into the work we do clinically, into the teaching we do clinically, and not just teaching learners about the inequities that patients face, but get them oriented towards action, that we can actually work together to overcome these inequities through management reasoning. So you can ask, again, a series of simple questions as you're getting ready to sign off on a patient, for instance. Are we deviating in any way from the standard of care in this situation? And I love this question because it overrides that statement of that's not possible for this patient. It gets the team to probe a little bit deeper. So are we deviating in any way from the standard of care in this situation? If the answer is yes, have the learner specify in what ways are we deviating specifically? And then why? What is the issue there? And it may be that it's patient preference, and then you can talk about how to engage with that. But it may be something related to the system. And if it is, you can say, instead of deviating, what could we do differently? How can we leverage our multidisciplinary team to overcome barriers? Um, and I, again, I really love this because it, it teaches around health and equity, but it also gets the learner to engage in that really important work of overcoming the inequities in our system. And it brings in this interdisciplinary component of management reasoning, which is really just a big part of what we do. So when I think about it all laid out in particular, and you can engage in this exercise as you get ready to attend next time, think about the clinical reasoning micro skills we talked about today, those in diagnosis and those in management, and start to consider what are learner behaviors that help you figure out, hey, the learner is really struggling in that area, and I can focus on that one skill and help bring their clinical uh, reasoning a little bit closer to expertise. And then think about the different educational interventions you can deploy. And we talked about several today to focus in, to hone in on that one particular micro skill. And, there, and then despite the variability in our practice, despite how busy we are on these large teams with big clinical services, that we can still do deliberate practice and help our learners um, become better at clinical reasoning, especially with an ID. I think this is so perfect for the work we do in ID. So um, I'll just end, because I love to leave plenty of time for questions, but to tell you a little bit about some of the other work we have ongoing, because a lot of what we know about management reasoning is really from um, expert opinion uh, and perspective pieces and not so much in empiric work, but we're, we're working to, to change that. So I have some antimicrobial reasoning work going on um, with different types of learners in different contexts. So with UCSF thinking about IM and pharmacy residents um, here at Michigan Medicine, we're thinking about how do medical students engage in management reasoning around antimicrobials, and then thinking about therapeutic reasoning of ART um, with some colleagues at UW. Um, we're also looking at what management reasoning skills uh, actually happen in practice. So do we have that list correct? And that is a multi-site study with BU, Minnesota, um, Harvard and others, um, as well as one looking at what residents sort of and medical students understand themselves to be learning about management reasoning with UVA, um, and then doing some interprofessional antimicrobial reasoning um, with pharmacy and internal medicine with UCSF. And then we're all, I'm also doing some work in deliberate practice with colleagues. So how does expertise develop in subspecialty I am physicians at Michigan Medicine, and then looking at validation of the management reasoning teaching tool, the equity reflection um, with colleagues in ID from across uh, the United States. So uh, I, with all those projects going on at different sites, I have a lot of people to acknowledge. I have several amazing mentees here at Michigan Medicine, um, in ID, in Palm, and in uh, the internal medicine residency. I'm fortunate to work with um, several past colleagues at UCSF on some of this interdisciplinary work, um, and then with others across the country at various institutions on management reasoning, 
um, and deliberate practice. And I have to acknowledge um, the University of Michigan has a Center for Learning and Teaching that provides small seed grants for medical education work, as does the AAMC through its group on educational affairs. Um, and then UCSF also has a fund for educational research. So it is possible, the grants aren't la large, but if you're interested in medical education work, the grants are out there and they favor this sort of work that brings um, in considerations for practice and involves involvement with multiple institutions. So if this is at all of interest to you, please reach out to me. I love to extend collaborations and connect you with the larger network of folks working on management reasoning and deliberate practice. So in conclusion, clinical reasoning is a complex iterative process and further exploration of management reasoning is needed. The development of expertise requires more than just time and training. Deliberate practice is one model for the development of expertise that has been broadly applied in medicine. Deliberate practice requires fulfillment of multiple relatively strict criteria. It has been useful in the mastery learning of procedures, but evidence of its use in cognitive skill development is still limited. And if you're interested, I do have slides about some of the um, programs that have been developed for doing this uh, in a more systematic way, micro skills um, in, in more of the cognitive specialties. And then focusing on micro skills is the mainstay of deliberate practicing or, or deliberate practice. Focusing on core skills allows for deliberate practice in clinical reasoning, despite the diversity of cases we see, which um, I know we want to continue. That's one of the reasons why we uh, do ID. So thank you so much. I'm happy uh, to take questions, comments, um, and, uh, and engage in a discussion with you in the time that we have remaining. Amy, that was, uh, uh, Emily, that was excellent. Um, if anyone has questions, uh, please go ahead. You can unmute yourself and ask away. Um, while people are doing that, I'll start out just by, I'm sure you've been asked this, and I might sound silly asking it, but in terms of artificial intelligence, how, I mean, how has that entered into, I mean, the field and maybe into your work? And also, do you see any threats or misinformation risks through AI in terms of, uh, you know, training, management, uh, decision making and, and such? Yeah, thanks so much for that question, Keith. Very timely. So, um, a lot of what's going on around AI and clinical reasoning is coming out of NYU and Mark Triola. And they're fortunate there because they have um, a system where they're able to collect a ton of information um, through their medical record applied to their educational systems about particular learners and the work that they're doing. Um, and it's really intriguing. They actually have a, um, a project where they've built a tool that um, assesses the quality of the reasoning in residents' notes that they write, um, and then tries to uh, sort of intervene on that and figure out, well, what are the pitfalls? And what they actually find uh, or have found among many findings is, is that the best reasoning um, in notes is, are the notes that are written um, at the end of a night shift. And so you may think about there could be a variety of reasons for that. Sometimes having the time to sort of focus on that one patient, not having to worry about other issues like discharge may contribute to that. Um, night float has long been heralded. Night admissions is a time when, you know, residents have the autonomy to sort of apply their thinking and see it play out and then time to write about it. Um, uh, but it, you know, they're doing further work to try to figure out why that's the case. I have my own thoughts about natural, um, language processing and determining the reasoning quality in the notes. And we know that sometimes great reasoning happens and the notes don't necessarily reflect that. So there are some barriers there, but they've also developed programs where, um, learners write their notes they have their admitting diagnosis, and then the learner gets an email uh, automated the next day that has like key papers and and you know electronic chapters and up to date articles to read about that diagnosis. I think the click rate is something like five to ten percent, so relatively low. But one could say for an educational intervention that you get five to ten percent of busy 
on inpatient ward medicine residents to click on some additional learning, maybe maybe that's worth it, especially if it can be automated. So um, there's a lot happening there. I think to your question about the pitfalls, in addition to just how, what our capabilities are to really understand the quality of reasoning in a written note through natural language processing, that's one. Another one is that a lot of these um, systems or a lot of these uh, things like chat GPT, the it's sort of, you know, the quality of the information in really affects the quality of the information out. And so the biases that are in our systems, um, the mistakes that are in our systems, the fact that the, you know, it's all this unwieldy information out of out there, some from reputable sources, some not, it's gonna, it's gonna take a long time to be able to reliably use those tools. But I think it's incumbent on all of us to think about how do we how do we incorporate this and teach learners how to recognize the pitfalls um, rather than pretending like they're not using these sorts of things to write notes or generate differential diagnoses. Thanks, Emily. I think that's your uh, Susan Borkoff has a question. Sure. Hi. Um, yeah, I think about a lot of what you talk about all the time on rounds, and I think, you know, what you're saying in the framework is really important, but my question is the effect of um, right, note templates and of copy pasting on anybody's ability to, well, first of all, on the person who's, quote, writing the note to actually show any thinking at all. And then also to for someone who's trying to analyze the note, know what's accurate and what's actually thought. And because it seems like it's a lot sloppier thinking in this era than there was when people had to actually write their notes every day. Yeah. And, you know, I um, I am a Luddite when it comes to this thing. If I could just write without a template and I wasn't, you know, needing to have all this stuff inserted in my note for billing purposes through Epic. I would be much, much happier if I could just make it uh, my own. And I think that there's a balance. I think probably a lot of us have seen trainees are spending less time on notes. And in part, that's good from a wellness perspective and an hours perspective. But I think part of what we can do is model and teach where we see the value in the note. And I've long been a proponent that a note is a love letter to the next ID provider who gets reconsulted on the patient. Um, I'd like to think that it was a love letter to other members of the clinical team, but I know who I'm writing for. I'm writing for the person who has to figure out what's happening, why I thought what I did and why I did what I did. Um, and so I try to instill that in trainees and say, you know, all this stuff is going to come in. But if you can spend just a little bit of time and if you're pithy, all the better, with your assessment and your plan and describing why you're doing what you're doing and maybe even putting in some contingency thinking, you make your note a lot that more valuable to the team, to the next ID provider, and if you're doing follow-up, then to yourself. So I think it's teaching them where to spend their time. And to me, their time is best spent in the assessment and plan. Um, and that's where I focus when I'm teaching as well. That's where I give them the most feedback uh, when I review their notes, which is another part of the, the clinical reasoning teaching I do. They actually get notes from me with comments on them that I print, print out. Um, and the medical students find it really, really valuable because they don't get that kind of feedback by the time they're on electives. Um, in terms of your the part of your question that dealt, dealt with analysis, I think at NYU, they've mostly focused on clinical reasoning around the initial HMP, um, and they focus there because there's not as much copy forward. It's a new note type. It's harder to copy forward, and at least there, they should presumably be having to do some original writing and thinking around the topic, but it's not perfect. Well, we see consult notes where the original consult note is just copying someone else's consult note. And you can't tell if there's any thinking anywhere in them. So um, it's a really big problem. It is a big problem. Um, I encounter that as well. You know, I tell I tell our trainees, like other people copy our HMPs. We don't do the opposite. Like there's nothing that drives me crazier than to see the medicine HMP copied and pasted into the 
ID consult, H, you know, initial history. Um, and so I think that setting that expectation with learners up front is really helpful. It drives me, it makes me <laughs> stay a little less annoyed during my time on attending. I'm say like, I know that you're trying to be efficient, but it's really, really important to me and in the notes that I sign that it's your work, the history you took, your thinking in the assessment and plan. And I, I really want you to do that. And then sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but then that's a whole nother area of feedback and working with trainees. I think Dr. Nehaus, Ron, do you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Emily. Hopefully my audio is working today. Um, great talk, a uh, huge fan of this uh, line of thinking, and I think we're really challenged, and Susan alluded to some of the challenges with the EHR and helping to move this effort forward. I had two different sort of either perspectives or questions. One, and, and you alluded to this a little bit, uh, in particular as it relates to ID, you know, the valuation of clinical reasoning and thinking is is undervalued. We all understand that. And in fact, I think that challenges an awful lot of us in how to train or educate that because, you know, other things are more rewarded. You can spend less time, be better rewarded, and spending the time to not only train, but the valuation of it's, you know, also um, creates impediments to doing this work. As you look at doing it, have you incorporated thoughts about, because because I think when I listen to you, you could be a really strong advocate about how important the value of this is to good care. Mm -hmm. And so I see that as linked in, in, in the kind of work that you're doing. And I'm really interested in your perspectives on that. The second question, and then I'll let you answer has to do with one of my uh, sort of pet peeves that I'm challenged with, which is around shared decision-making. And training that I think is challenging in part because when we're asking patients to provide shared decision-making around what are really complicated issues, their perspectives can be very um, me-centric. And in our world, that's a big deal. So for example, measles vaccination in Florida um, if we give shared decision making, you know, a certain weight in our algorithms and training, we may underperform from a public health perspective, which is really not ideal. I think most of us on this call would agree. Yet we've given shared decision making and the family or the mom or the parent who is doing that is, is thinking, well, you know, the risk is only 5%. You know, it's not a great risk. I don't really like vaccines. I really believe, you know, Mr. Kennedy and, you know, we shouldn't get those vaccines. So I find the challenge of shared decision-making, albeit important, training it brings up a whole conundrum of issues for me. So I'm interested in both questions, the valuation issue and the training of shared decision-making. Uh, two very easy questions. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Those are those are the conundrums. So I think on the the in the area of value, I mean, fortunately, I'm I'm glad at the level of our societies, people are thinking about how do we show our worth, and um, it's really interesting because we were talking about clinical reasoning and in, in me the medical education group of IDSA recently. And there's not that many people who do clinical reasoning with an ID. And one of the people said to me, I find it hard to believe that in the individual sort of known for doing this, so few people are, are doing the research. And a lot of the work has been done by more generalists. A lot of hospitalists are engaged in this work. So I think we could have more visibility there, but I, I hope that there's a movement to sort of recognize the complexity of these issues, but it is hard to quantify. And so that's where going back to Keith's question about how does AI and some of this play into it, I could see uh, AI being a real asset here if it could help us figure out um, ways to quantify complexity of thinking uh, in a way that that health systems can recognize and, and reward. Um, but it's it's a really big problem in our country. We saw it play out in COVID. A ton of people were doing a lot of thinking around how to take care of patients, not just with COVID, but with everything else when we didn't have our usual diagnostic and treatment tools. And yet health systems were, uh, were shutting down or hemorrhaging because they couldn't bill for simple 
procedure, elective procedures that um, drive the bottom line. So more work done here. I don't have the answers, but I'm I'm glad people are advocating for it and maybe AI can help us there rather than hurt us. I think for your second question around shared decision-making, um, part of the training around it has to be with the nuance and what we mean when we say shared decision-making. Um, aside from some of the public health concerns, when medicine first swung from paternalism to autonomy, one of the issues is that patients almost became saddled with too much choice. Like you said, the complex situations. So it's not even just that they were making wrong choices, it's that the whole burden was put on them. And I think it's important when we train trainees um, that we emphasize to them that this isn't about putting the onus for decision on, decisions on patients. To me, it's a similar process to I, what I do with trainees. I I make the black box that is my head, the decisions in there more, try to make it more transparent. And so when I talk with patients about antibiotics, I'm clear, I'll say like, look, I think we have a couple of options here. Um, this option, you know, has more, has, has had been more studied in this particular situation. I think it's highly efficacious. It also, you know, has a higher rate of toxicity uh, or may have these potential adverse effects. Whereas this option um, might be a little less onerous, um, might not have as many burden of side effects, but um, the, the efficacy evidence isn't as strong there. And so I try to provide people with reasons why I might choose one or the other. And I always offer to them, um, you know, I'm happy to tell you what I think, but I want to hear you reflect on these different um, considerations and which ones matter um, to you. Uh, I think in the realm of public health, it's okay uh, to sort of not, <laughs> you engage in shared decision making and people have a choice, but that doesn't mean you have to endorse all choices as equal um, or all choices as reasonable. Um, we do that all the time with deciding whether or not antibiotics are warranted. And sometimes we get into sticky situations there where the patient wants antibiotics and we don't think it's indicated. Um, but I see those as, as kind of analogous, although the public health implications aren't as strong. Um, so I, I've rambled a bit, but I think it comes down to teaching trainees the nuance. First, they learn it's important to get the patient's perspective. Then they learn what it means to offer different options and show their thinking so that the burden isn't entirely on the patient, but they understand the choice. And then it's also understanding that um, patients have a choice, but we don't have to endorse all the choices. Thanks. I think we're at the top of the hour. So Emily, I want to thank you again for an excellent talk and I hope everyone has a great rest of their week. Thanks everybody. Thank you all. Have a good week.